You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England that are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of a collected work by Rudolf Steiner, number 181. Main title is Dying Earth and Living Cosmos. Uh, it's composed of three, small, three cycles of lectures. This is the 21st lecture, which is in fact the last lecture in the book, and the last of seven lectures in the last sub-cycle, which was entit- is entitled The Need for New Forms of Consciousness. Translated by Matthew Barton. This is again lecture 21, the last lecture in the book. This was given in Berlin on the 6th of August, 1918. In our recent reflections, you will have seen that we are trying to shape ideas drawn from spiritual science in ways that can serve us when we seek to understand events occurring on a daily or hourly basis in our modern culture. Today is a kind of last appendix to these reflections. I will offer what can be no more than aphoristic characterizations of our modern era and connect these with various fundamental aspects introduced in the course of these lectures. It is particularly noticeable today that of all the hindrances and obstacles apparent in modern culture, the mode of thinking, the nature of our ideas as these have evolved over recent centuries, gives people little capacity of foresight for approaching events. This becomes clear in the surprise experienced when events overtake us, seemingly without any capacity on our part to predict them or to believe that this might be possible. People think that what happens cannot be predicted and that they must simply allow events to overtake them. Whenever one speaks of forthcoming occurrences, people are very surprised, or else they ironically discount this supposed longing for prophetic powers. If one draws attention to things now spreading across the globe from far eastern regions, emerging from causes I have recently commented on here, One meets with little understanding, even though such developments are only too apparent. There is far too little desire to form form real insights, and connected with this, so little will to engage with truths that point without natural limits to what will happen in future. Of course, I am not speaking, as you will realize, of any kind of soothsaying or misguided prophecy but of a serious, scholarly outlook and mode of thought. This reluctance or inability to prefigure future developments has deep roots, but in general we can say that people are unaware of how far back the causes of things lie, and that on the whole they seek these causes in things that are far too close or superficial. If I try to describe the causes of this relative blindness, I must seek it in a deeply rooted tendency in human souls today to embrace dead concepts and ideas rather than living ones. It is, of course, understandable that people cannot think about what is coming toward them in the same concept as they have formed of past events. But today people only give credence to what, as they say, can be, in quotes, proven, And in seeking such proof, they turn to that particular form of evidence of which they are nowadays so enamored. A clear understanding of this particular mode of proof will show us that it serves only to confirm truths that relate to everything in decline in the universe, everything that is dying. This is why people today want a science or just a mode of perception that relates only to everything which dies. People who think themselves most enlightened have a predilection for knowledge and also for a form of will that relates to dying things. 
In the broadest sense, there is a prevailing trend today, even if we are unaware of this, to engage only with decline. We fail to find the courage to conceive of living growth, since this cannot be encompassed in such rigid and narrowly defined terms, nor proven in the same way as decline or fading, dying tendencies. People defend themselves fiercely against more living forms of knowledge. If one stands up and opposes such things, as one must, one runs the risk of being called a ridiculous fantasist and dilettante, or perhaps even worse. People today try to formulate concepts that can arm them against having to think of things with germinal potential for the future. Those who consider themselves most intelligent inoculate themselves against such fruitful thinking with concepts such as the, quote, conservation of matter and energy, close quote, as this principle is nowadays formulated. Anyone who does not subscribe to this, quote, fundamental scientific principle, close quote, is regarded in certain circles, of course, as a, in quotes, blockhead. And yet, true perception of the cosmos will show us that matter and energy are transient and pass away and that all knowledge we can gain of matter and energy is a knowledge of their transience. It is actually precisely because people wish to have a science of transient things, wish only to allow fading and dying things to figure in science, that they dogmatically decree that substance or energy are eternal, to have at least something they can hold fast to, This law of the conservation of matter and energy also plays an important role for lay people with no scientific training, and they project it vaguely into everything. The idea of the conservation of matter and substance thus finds its way into all popular textbooks and all contemporary thinking, becoming a supposed self-evident truth for people. But we know from our reading of Title Occult Science that evolution has passed through phases we refer to as those of Saturn, Sun, Moon, and Earth. Nothing of what we refer to nowadays as substance and energy will endure beyond the stage of Venus evolution. By then even the most permanent of substances will have come to its end. We are now past the midpoint of planetary evolution and are currently in the fifth period of the earth phase of this evolution, somewhat beyond its midpoint. Having passed this midpoint, we are already living in a declining phase of earth evolution, or in other words, in a phase of decline in which substance and energy are fading away again. And when we study physics and chemistry, we would discern things properly if we recognize that insights gained in these fields relate only to transient things that will have disappeared no later than by the stage of Venus evolution. Nothing upon which modern science focuses today will ultimately endure, and the ideas and concepts invoked today to offer the kinds of proof of which people are so enamored relate only to this kind of transience. The whole of science concerns itself with transient things. We need to radically correct these ideas in this most fundamental of areas. And those who consider themselves to be the best trained scientists will need to learn a great deal if they are to replace their current concepts with true ones. But why am I saying all this? It may well seem to you that in general Such a thing is of no great importance. Actually, it is. You see, these ideas which people acquire and which then live in all their thinking inform other ideas and concepts according to which people live and inform also their will and actions. Social concepts, political ideas, are informed by the mode of thinking thus developed. 
They are formed in accordance with the distinctive use one makes of such forces, whereby thoughts and concepts are considered to be only transient. And this has a knock-on effect on people's daily thinking. We can see this in particularly striking form if we study the social programs of those who consider themselves the most progressive, the programs of many socialists, for instance, which are all the rage in many circles and are all based in one way or another on the theory formulated by Karl Marx. Marxism is currently the bane of Russia because, for reasons I explained last time, it informs current historical developments there. This Marxist outlook is at the same time the most extreme expression of the will to engage only with and control dying things. If you study Marxist ideas, you find that the most fanatical Marxists believe they possess ideas of great future potential. And yet, in fact, these ideas can only relate to everything that fades and withers. This appears in a naive way, especially in this, in quotes, socialist outlook, since it invariably refuses to establish any fruitful ideas of the future. Instead, it preaches the eradication of ideas, propounding the abolition of all that currently exists as a way of allowing something new to emerge by itself miraculously out of the resulting turmoil and confusion. I'm putting this radically, but then there are many too who, as we saw in the last lecture, abide by the teachings of the Church through many centuries and interpret the events of recent centuries in dogmatic ecclesiastical terms. And so we must say, that this outlook basically entirely refuses to cultivate ideas of future potential. It seeks only to produce ideas that can destroy all that has been established in the past. Those who propound these doctrines think there is future potential in their ideas, but what counts is how ideas become reality. In truth, these ideas have no potential to establish anything new but are concerned only to introduce destruction into existing institutions. This socialism appears to me like a lady, though of course I am harking back to the past here, who cannot bear to wear crinoline and detests hooped petticoats. This must change, says she. And what does she do? She lines it inside so that it looks just the same as it did before, outwardly, but is now lined with padding. This is what the socialists are doing. Instead of using new ideas to make fruitful the institutions that have emerged in the course of history, they leave them as they are, basically, simply taking the place of those who once administered these institutions. They preserve the petticoats and pad them out with lining. Here, too, we find an extreme outlook embodied in nothing but a longing to administer and manage all that is fading and dying. What is the cause of this? It is because the concepts in today's merely sense-based science, founded on a reasoning faculty that recognizes sensory perception alone, can only engage with all that withers and dies. It can only meet with elements of nature that lead toward death, not its living aspects. Science cannot comprehend life and living things. In culture, too, life is not comprehended, not germinal growth, but only what dies. You see, this germinal growth can only be encompassed in imaginations, by attaining at least the first level of higher knowledge as I have described in titled Knowledge of the Higher Worlds. To reach certain higher forms of knowledge, relating to perception of growing living things, we also need to be able to employ intuition and inspiration. In approaching phenomena with past concepts, people can go on talking till the cows come home, but they will never get beyond an engagement with decline and death unless they enter into what supersensible faculties alone 
can perceive of growth and life. Today things really are on a knife edge. Without certain forms of knowledge, without perception of the spirit, humanity will plunge into cultural chaos, which we are already familiar enough with. We need a renewal of the mysteries, and this is also something that the science of the spirit seeks to attain. For this, of course, the meaning of the ancient mysteries first has to be grasped, and then also the meaning of the period of history, which was, in a sense, an intermediate phase between these ancient mysteries and the new ones that are still to come. All this must be understood. Pupils of the ancient mysteries were astonished to find, as they were taught in vivid ways, that ancient atavistic, clairvoyant faculties and occult knowledge were inevitably declining. This was something they could not grasp themselves through their knowledge and vision, for it could be comprehended only through initiation into the mysteries. They were taught that something else, another condition, would dawn in humanity, replacing ancient clairvoyant vision of the world of spirit. Mystery pupils were shown that this old form of soul condition, this appearance of world breaths in imagination, was on its way out. This was explained to them roughly as follows. What can be seen on earth with the physical senses does not as such contain the intrinsic secrets of earth existence. These secrets can only be revealed if the human soul is granted clairvoyant vision of the mysteries of the cosmos and all extra-telluric reality. So that what happens in the extra-telluric cosmos dawns in this soul. This was what ancient clairvoyant vision showed, the non-physical realities of the spiritual cosmos, rather than what was happening on earth. And these mystery pupils were taught that such knowledge and perception, this ascent into the cosmos, would no longer be possible in future. And those who were to penetrate the Christ mystery were granted insight into something else as well. This, roughly, was the conception that arose. Although ancient seers did not speak of Christ, their inspirations came from the world in which Christ had always dwelt, since he is a cosmic being. Christ lives in the whole cosmos, and everything streaming from it as this is revealed to atavistic clairvoyance. But from the time when the mystery of Golgotha was to occur, people no longer had access to this as they once had. What happened? Well, the Christ descended from this world, from the cosmos down to earth. Christ had to descend to humankind because the spiritual cosmos was no longer accessible to people as it had once been in ancient times, and they could no longer have found Christ there by the old means. It died away, this mode of knowledge and sensibility of soul, in which the world where Christ lived was formerly perceived, and therefore Christ had to descend to humankind, and so he did. And thus everything which illumined minds had ever perceived of the world of spirit in ancient heathen mystery rites and in heathen mystery knowledge had now to be comprised in the Christ. Vision of it had to be found in Christ. We have to realize what kind of cosmic being had descended to the earth from the cosmos as Christ. That is one aspect. The other was as follows. Reason and the senses, as I said, can only perceive transient things, a knowledge of transients when they consider all of nature, and social and cultural life too. Everything now existing will come to an end by the Venus phase of evolution. Despite believing that cultural ideas, ideas about society, have growth potential, people very often stand in the stream of decline as they entertain them. What the senses perceive, and all that can be grasped by reason, has no germ of future potential, but is wedded to death. 
If this were all that existed, there would only be death knowledge, for the reality that surrounds us is itself wedded to death. Where can we look to find anything enduring, therefore? Where can we find a realm of eternal reality that will survive beyond this outward existence of ours, which is wedded to death? Where do we find something truly conserved? Atoms and forces which are thought to endure forever, according to belief systems and superstitions, rooted in the physical will, in fact go under. We find this only in the human being himself. Of all creatures, animals, plants, minerals, all the air, water, and everything else that will go under, there is one thing only that will be preserved beyond earthly evolution and other phases of evolution that follow it. And this is what lives within ourselves. Only we human beings bear within us on earth something that endures. It is misguided to speak of the conservation of atoms and matter. We can speak only of the conservation of something within ourselves. Yet this can be perceived only by means of imagination, inspiration and intuition. Nothing that is not perceived by supersensible perception endures. Everything in the sensory world is transient, and the supersensible, which endures, can therefore also only be encompassed by supersensible perception. We walk upon the earth, and within us lies everything that will survive of earth existence. If we wonder where to look for the germ of what will survive the earth, Jupiter and Venus phases of evolution, and what of modern culture will endure into a culture of the future, we have to recognize that nothing of the physical earth and cosmos will survive, but only what lies within us. In the part of our being which is accessible only to supersensible perception, we find something that bears the germ of the future. We cannot really speak of the future at all unless we have the will to comprehend the supersensible. Otherwise our ideas of the future are false. And this is why the Christ had to descend from worlds that were becoming ever more unavailable to human perception. He had to unite with the human being, establishing his dwelling place in Jesus and thus becoming Jesus Christ because only in a human body could be found the future potential of earthly evolution. In Christ we thus have the cosmic element, which was directly comprehended only through ancient perception, and in Jesus, to whom the Christ came, we have the only possible bearer of the germ of the future in the human will. We fail to understand Christ if we see him only as Christ or only as Jesus. The Christ of whom the ancient teachings of docetism spoke and kind of a kind of Gnostic doctrine can no longer be comprehended and was available only to ancient clairvoyance. We do not understand Jesus if we fail to grasp that Christ entered him. If we do not acknowledge Christ within Jesus, we do not comprehend that only through the germ of humanity on earth will cosmic reality be rescued for the future. To understand that Christ Jesus is a dual being is a great and important task. Yet at the same time many have sought to hinder such understanding. In modern times diverse efforts have been made to assign to oblivion the knowledge that Christ lived in Jesus. On the one hand, we have the extreme theological doctrine that speaks only of the simple man of Nazareth, and thus really only of a person endowed with our ordinary sensory nature, rather than of the one who bears the germ of our future potential. Then there is a society, too, that was founded to oppose the idea of Christ, and to this end to establish a false idea of Jesus the Society of the Jesuits, which largely exists to drive out the Christ from the Jesus Christ picture, leaving only Jesus as a kind of tyrant looming over evolving humanity. 
All this must be seen in context. The diverse impulses to which I am referring act more powerfully in modern life than people realize. They act very powerfully and intensely. If we do not open our eyes fully to these things and seek to grasp the real effects of what is happening, we will continually be surprised by all that comes. In many respects, our modern culture is far too sluggish to recognize such things. Spiritual scientific concepts are far too difficult for many, and people therefore denigrate them as unscientific fantasy and dilettantism. For reasons I have explained, they condemn themselves at the same time to dispensing with anything of real future potential. Around us we see a wasteland today, and chaos into which old religious confessions and cultural traditions have led us. In the midst of this chaos, which people very naively regard as war, although it has gone far beyond warfare to become something quite different, we find a wasteland of ideas and outlooks. Only by grasping the supersensible, the spiritual realm, would ideas arise that are not barren. Today we must decide either to engage with decline and death and become a pupil of Lenin, or to reckon with the supersensible, which encompasses what must emerge in future. I am not talking about the lone individual Lenin, whose ideas are currently causing such mischief in Eastern Europe. I take him more as the symbol of a chronic condition, for there are many Lenins spread far and wide in one field or another. The realm of dying and death is the only one people are seeking out and engaging with at present. Let us recall something I once said here, that a plant lives and can be described as a living entity. But when modern science tackles plant life today, it does not find a living quality, which is supersensible, but describes substances that are the vehicle for life, the dead mineral aspects. In modern science you will find an account only of the mineral and in fact death-bearing constituents of living things and therefore people cannot raise themselves to really fruitful ideas about nature. The concepts prevalent in modern botany do not accord with life. Instead they describe the minerals that make up living entities and circulate within them. As soon as one goes beyond this circulating mineral element in plant, animal or the human being, each of these is found to be quite different in nature from the way it is usually described. Consider the zoologist von Oxkell, let me say that again, Uxquell, who wrote an essay entitled The Battle for the Soul of the Animal. This gentleman displays a masochistic cruelty in relation to all psychology or anything the least related to it. I say in quotes masochistic cruelty because of the following sentiments in his essay, quote, there is no need to determine whether there is such a thing as the soul or not, but only that science cannot make anything of it. Close quote. A properly cruel or ferocious person actually kills something, whereas someone who is masochistically cruel, like this Mr. Uxquell, just dabbles a little in killing, tries it out. This is typical of modern science, though people fail to notice because they turn aside from it. People do not like rupturing the partition that sunders them from their surroundings and so they cannot break through to find the concepts that are really needed for understanding these surroundings. From the science of the spirit we know that the core, integral nature of the human being descends from worlds of spirit and connects with our flesh and blood, the material covering in which we are enclosed between birth and death or rather between conception and death. Nowadays, scientists study issues surrounding conception and birth, embryonic development. But these fields cannot be studied since this research addresses only the dead elements embedded in life. This will never enable people to understand the only thing that can make the human being comprehensible, 
the fact that when we descend from worlds of spirit, we are received by father and mother and then pass through the whole of fetal development. Science today holds to the arrogant view that a father and mother give a child its existence and that since they are the core of the family and the family is the foundation for social community, so social communities, as enlarged families, think that they own the human being. But this mean little idea is very far from the truth. What does a human being receive in the act of conception, and what does he gain from it? We receive here, as spiritual science can show us, the capacity to become a mortal creature. The act of conception endows us with the possibility of dying. This is the inevitable consequence of other things I have described in various books. At the moment of conception already, we integrate into us what makes it possible for us to die here on earth. The whole of life between birth, excuse me, from birth to death is a development toward death, and death is inoculated into us at conception. Our nature as living entity and human being is not somehow created at conception, but instead this moment inoculates our otherwise immortal being with the opportunity to die. Parents, in fact, can only give their offspring the gift of death, although this is putting it radically, of course, the opportunity to bear a mortal body here on earth. The life within this body has to descend from the spiritual world. What descends from the world of spirit enables this whole organism of ours, the whole mechanism with which we are clothed on earth, which we receive at conception with the germ of death, to be alive. We need to learn to connect the human being again in his most tangible appearance with the evolution of the spiritual cosmos. And to do this we have to move beyond cowardly fears and timid apprehensions to really tackle the loftiest problems facing science. If we shy away from them, we will not even understand the things that live in our closest proximity. We can say that the most diverse peoples live also in our immediate proximity. Just think of the misguided thoughts which Woodrow Wilson has summoned from the idea of nations and peoples. We have often spoken of this. We have to realize that the idea of different races will never be properly understood if we do not engage with the whole of earthly evolution. Why is it that the population of the globe has been divided into these different races and nations. Spiritual science teaches us that world evolution began with the Saturn embodiment of the Earth, followed by the Sun embodiment, the Moon stage, and now our current Earth stage. This will be followed by a Jupiter embodiment and so forth. But we should see, but we should not see this too schematically with an ancient Saturn planet transforming smoothly into the Sun and Moon and Earth stages. Rather, this evolution is a continuous alternation in which the Sun first separates from the Earth and then the Moon does. Bodies separate, then reunite and separate again. What I have just referred to as cosmic evolution, involving this separation, played a part in ancient clairvoyance. What can be summed up as the human germ of the future remained unconsciously present in this clairvoyance, remained phonic, as it is called in ancient seership, in the ongoing advance of earthly evolution. You see, what comes from the universe was destined to die and was preserved only by virtue of luciferic power. And thus diverse differentiations entered from the cosmos and developed into nations and races. But these cosmic forces were impregnated with luciferic powers. In contrast to these diverse, differentiated peoples, there stands, as was understood by a better era than our own, the universal human. And this has a quite different origin. We can speak of this in the abstract, but we will only speak of its reality by truly grasping the germ of the future within us, 
which contains nothing national or nationalistic. This is a quality that did not descend from the cosmos, but which Christ approached and united himself with. The Christ did not unite himself with any national trait, as, say, Jehovah did, but instead with the universal human. He was in the community of gods, from whom nations developed, but he departed from this realm when it was ripe for decline, came to earth and took up dwelling in the universal human. It is the greatest blasphemy to invoke the name of Jesus Christ for anything partisan, for anything other than the universal human. And it is in this sense only that we can say, not I, but Christ in me. This is one of the most vital insights for the future. To understand Christ Jesus' relationship to humanity and also to grasp that everything of a national or nationalistic nature is outside the realm of Christ Jesus and is an old residue of something that was already ripe for decline at the time of the mystery of Golgotha. All things cling on beyond their time like withered fruit. What was ripe for decline has clung on only as a science that turns its focus upon decline and death, and which, like modern science or the social sciences, concerns itself only with ideas that can engage with decline, either all that withers and dies in nature or cultural decline. In cultural history we can sometimes see a real clash occurring between this decline which seeks to live in dead abstract ideas, considering them significant, and the impulse to grasp hold of the human seed, which alone has future potential. I have frequently referred to an important conversation between Goethe and Schiller, when these two were once at a meeting of the Research Association in Jena. The botanist Batch had given a lecture, And as Schiller was leaving, he said to Goethe, This botanical approach fragments everything, dispels all unifying impetus. At this, Goethe, in a few characteristic strokes, described to Schiller his approach to plant metamorphosis. And then the latter said, But that is not your experience. It is just an idea. Schiller was unable to raise himself to vision of the human being who bears the future within him, nor of the resulting ability to find, in turn, a future-sustaining power in the world, which is the supersensible. And therefore he replied to Goethe that the latter's perception was not experience or observation, but merely an idea. And Goethe responded by saying, Well, then I see my ideas with my eyes. He felt what he was describing to be something he also saw, and was as real to him as anything he might have observed with his physical senses. Here then we have two figures face to face. Schiller, who could not raise his perception to the supersensible, but entertained only the dead abstract idea, and Goethe, who sought to draw from what he perceived in nature something that bears futurity within it, the eternal in the human being, for whom everything transient is but a metaphor, He sought to unite what he perceived outside him with something eternal. And he was not understood because he had vision of something supersensible and enduring and looked upon this as if observing sensory phenomena. What our time needs, therefore, is to develop this Gertian approach. Insight will only come when we realize that something like the diverse religious confessions, including those founded on the Old Testament, and especially Catholicism, are only a perpetuation of something old that has clung on past its time, a withered branch of evolution that has to assert itself through outward power structures. This redundant impetus is accompanied by something that seeks to bear nothing but transience, impermanence, into the future. And this is Americanism. And this explains the affinity between Americanism and Jesuitism, as I described it last time. Gertianism stands in opposition to all such phenomena. In saying this, I don't wish to fix dogmatically on a name. 
one has to use names to point to something that goes far beyond a name's narrower scope. By Goetheanism, I do not mean what Goethe thought up in 1832, but rather what may take another millennium or so to be thought along Goethean lines, all that can develop from Goethe's vision and ideas. It is due to this that everything clinging to withering powers regards Goetheanism in any form as its enemy. Here we can witness the greatest cultural paradoxes. It is highly paradoxical that one of the most inventive books on Goethe was, however unlikely this seems, written by a Jesuit, Father Baumgartner. This is a book that delves deeply into Goethe. It is characteristic, of course, that anything associated with Jesuitism will oppose Goethe, and this is a spirited, deep book, not flitting superficially over its subject. It really does summon the man and describe him vividly, unlike another book by the English aristocrat Luz, who calls Goethe a mere 18th-century Philistine to whom no regard is due. The Jesuit book on Goethe, on the other hand, reveals a real cultural paradox, and here one can see the opposing forces that clash within one author's mind. On a smaller scale, we find the same thing in our own circles. As long as we were regarded as a small sect, in quotes, few people bothered attacking anthroposophy. But now that it has greater prominence, the fiercest attacks are launched on us, particularly by Jesuit circles. It, is no longer, it no longer suffices for the periodical titled Stimmen der Zeit to publish an article opposing us, but it devotes whole issues to the subject. This is why I keep emphasizing that we should not think that we will appeal to the better nature of these circles by explaining to them that we are invoking Christ, that we are cultivating an understanding of Christ. These people are fiercely opposed to such a thing. This is precisely what they want to prevent. Anything that is not a part of ecclesiastical doctrine should not be asserted about Christ, in their view. Let us, therefore, cease to be so naive as to believe that we can appease Catholicism by explaining that we are good Christians. It is this very thing that we do all in our power to nurture Christianity that makes Catholicism our greatest enemy. Such naivete in regard to these things must increasingly be banished from our circles. Instead, we should become ever more discerning, clear-sighted about the powers both declining and dawning, that live around us. We must reach further than the small longing so prevalent amongst us to seek just a little bit more of an imaginative faculty. I have often said this. Instead of securing ourselves just a little bit of an imaginative world, we must be able to relate our spiritual science to contemporary cultural ideas, becoming keen observers of what actually lives in the modern world. Only spiritual science gives a perspective that can enable us to really observe this world. Many come to me and tell me that they have seen one thing or another. Well, they certainly have. Imaginations are not so far removed from human evolution and will increasingly approach us. Many ask me, for instance, whether it was the guardian of the threshold they saw. But it is not so easy just to reply yes or no to such a question since the answer encompasses the whole of human evolution. Yet the answers have been given. At present I am revising my book titled Occult Science, a new edition of which is about to be published. And I find that it actually includes everything needed to answer such questions, all necessary caution with regard to them, all checks and balances one needs, are carefully described there. The feelings one needs to develop are described there too, and these things are clearly indicated, although you will have to read the book with sufficient care to see this. I would have had to write thirty volumes to explain every detail of what is contained in occult science. In reading this book you have to think for yourself too and draw your own conclusions, and this is perfectly possible. I don't like writing huge tomes, but if you read this book 
carefully, you will discover that certainly seeking the supersensible world will bring you an encounter with the guardian of the threshold. Yet this encounter is not as simple or straightforward as having a dreamy imagination, which is the most comfortable way of entering the world of spirit. The encounter with the guardian of the threshold is a tragedy, a battle for survival involving all concepts and laws of cognition and all human connections with the spiritual world, with Araman and Lucifer too. By encountering the guardian of the threshold you enter catastrophic circumstances. If by contrast you see just a dreamlike imagination before you, this means that you are trying to slip easily past this encounter, to have a dream of the guardian of the threshold as substitute for the real encounter. It is necessary to approach these things with healthy thinking, which, as will then become apparent, contains the basis for curing all superstition and everything that opponents of spiritual science accuse it of. Besides this, a healthy mode of thinking that can raise itself to experience of the spiritual realm contains all germinal power we need in order to emerge from the current catastrophe in which the world is plunged. We will be led out of it by something that is not comprehended on earth, or not alone in the sensory realm, not in ruinous institutions that exploit and misuse resources, but in something that is not yet in existence. We must find burning enthusiasm for grasping something not yet present. Yet this can only be grasped by comprehending and pursuing a mode of supersensible knowledge rather than by looking back to the past. People such as Kautsky prefer to look back to the past and base their view of humanity's future on anthropology. To understand present social conditions, they study past states when we were as yet scarcely human. Those, such as Kautsky, are the true sons of a misunderstood Catholicism. Yet looking back to the past like this will not help. Since back then the foundations of our modern era were created only by atavistic instinctive powers. In the future nothing will any longer be based on instinct. And if people try to draw on what is still present in them from ancient instinctive times, they will never reach the future potential in them that can lead us out of catastrophe. We need a true stance toward the world of spirit in order to develop a real, engaged and serious understanding of the present. I would have to speak for many hours if I were to address such themes more fully and examine issues that are currently of much concern. But over the summer weeks, when we will not be meeting, you will come far in an understanding of the cosmic Christ and the earthly Jesus, if you really meditate on all we have been discussing here, culminating in the need to perceive a dual Christ-Jesus figure. You will see that the cosmic Christ descended from worlds of spirit, since these worlds were henceforth to be closed to human vision. And because the human being was destined to grasp the seed of future potential that lies within himself. In this cosmic Christ, and in the earthly, the humanistic Jesus, and the union of both, lies much that can help solve the riddle of the cosmos, at least the part of it that concerns humanity. Within the human being lies the seed of the future. But this seed must be fertilized by Christ Jesus. If this does not happen, the seed will become aramonically configured, and the earth will end in error and confusion. Thus we find solutions to a great many contemporary questions by fathoming the Christ Jesus secret. But you should not seek these solutions in a superficial way through what is often regarded as theosophy, mysticism, or such like, through some, quote, union with the spirit, close quote, or a, quote, merging with the universe, close quote. Instead, try to really discern what is happening around us today and to comprehend it through what you draw from the science of the spirit. As all kinds of issues start to be resolved 
you will increasingly discover that humanity today truly seeks practical, not theoretical answers. If it does not try to cultivate the spirit, it will find itself in a cul-de-sac and be forced to acknowledge that it cannot get any further. Wherever we fail to pursue the spirit, to journey spiritually, we will find that our efforts wither on the bow. Whether or not people will strive spiritually is of great importance for humanity's future. Today I want to plant in your hearts a sense of the feelings that can emerge and develop from our recent reflections. It is also very likely that this is the last time we will meet in this hall, which we have become fond of over many years, and where many of these lectures have been held. These were the first premises we furnished in accordance with our own ideas, although, of course, only within a given scope. We furnished it as we did because our spiritual scientific endeavors ought not to be something merely theoretical, but should come to expression in everything that surrounds our human encounters. This hall is now being taken from us, and we must seek another. But naturally, in present circumstances, we will not be able to furnish it in the same way that we furnished this one. We will have to make do with whatever premises we find. Premises we find. We have become attached to this hall since it cannot be assumed that we can speak of our connection with the Spirit elsewhere in the same way as here, where we attempted to configure some aspects of the space as we did on a larger scale in Dornach. In earlier times we often had to make do. Some among you may still recall us holding lectures in a pub. I stood there with an audience in front of me and behind me the publican was drawing pints. On another occasion we gathered in a kind of barn. We had been promised a different space, but we were only given that one in the end. In other cities I sometimes lectured in pubs too, some of which had no proper floor, and we had to cope with such things. But in fact, at core, we cannot wish this, and to say we can speak of the Spirit in the same loving way anywhere, in any space at all, would be to misunderstand the nature of our movement. Spirit exists to penetrate, imbue, and configure matter, and this applies too to social and economic life, as I suggested today. Because of all this, we will find it very difficult indeed to say farewell to this hall in a few weeks' time and to leave these premises that anthroposophists so kindly helped to furnish and decorate. But a departure and farewell such as this is also something we must regard in the proper way, as a kind of symbol. Over forthcoming decades people will have to take their leave from much that they hold dear. People do not realize this as yet and will be surprised when it comes, But those who have really grasped the inmost impulse of spiritual science will recognize that whatever uncertainties approach, one thing will not founder or waver. What we have encompassed in the spirit and what we have spiritually resolved to realize, all that we do when we act out of the spirit, irrespective of how it appears amidst the tumult of the present, will turn out to be for the best. Our departure from this place can therefore stand as a symbol. We must find other premises. But we will carry with us a core and foundation which we know not only to be that of our own deepest inner being, but also the deepest inner being of the world, upon which humanity must build if it wishes to build well. Spiritual science gives us a sure and firm conviction that what we draw from it and pursue by its means cannot be taken from us by anyone, and that it cannot be taken from humanity either, but that it must lead human conditions to a state of greater health. We may well not yet know how we will accomplish many things, but we will accomplish what is needed if we hold fast to the science of the Spirit. Let us grasp fully the significance of Gertianism for spiritual science, and at the same time recognize, as I recently explained, that the world today scorns and disparages everything associated with Central European culture of the 18th and early 19th century. Nevertheless, 
if we become fully aware of these things, we can still stand our ground and recognize that whatever may come, this Central European culture will bear fruit in humanity's future progress. Humanity's future depends on it. The adversaries of this Central European culture scorn and disparage it precisely because they do not wish to embrace humanity's true future, preferring to evade it. We can, however, acknowledge this Central European culture to the full, recognizing its spiritual nature and knowing that we can build upon these foundations. And then we can also be sure that even if every devil in Christendom conspires to bring about this culture's downfall, it will not founder. But, equally, that only what is connected with the true spirit will not go under. That is the end of Lecture 21 and the end of the book, Collected Works, Volume 181, entitled Dying Earth and Living Cosmos, The Living Gifts of Anthroposophy, The Need for New Forms of Consciousness, translated by Matthew Barton.